Thank you, and welcome to the June 7th Dr. Cog board work session. I'm Wynne Shaw, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog and the Chair of today's board work session. It's four o'clock and our meeting is now in order. The first business in order is to open up the period for public comment. Melinda, do you see any hands raised for public comment? Uh, at this time, Madam Chair, I do not. All right, thank you very much. With no one here for public comment, we'll close the period of public comment. Our next business in order is the summary of the March 1st board work session. Our, that's a long time ago. <laughs> Are there questions or changes? Hearing none, uh, the summary will be accepted as distributed. The next business in order is an update on development of a comprehensive economic development strategy or SEDS. Dr. Flo Retano, Director, Partnership and Innovation. Thank you for being here and the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully everybody is seeing that. Yes. Yep. Terrific. Well, it's been a little while since um, we've talked to you about uh, our progress on the outreach for, for creating a comprehensive economic development strategy for do the Dr. Cog region. And this afternoon, I'd like to give you an update as well as talk a little bit more about the timeline and then give you a bit more insight into what a SEDS actually is and, and what our next steps will be. So following the June 15th board meeting last year, um, we started to reach out to potential strategic partners as directed by you all at that meeting. And, and uh, this is a list of some of the more important partner meetings that we've had over the last year. It, it's not a comprehensive and inclusive list. It doesn't include some of the smaller meetings that we've had with representatives from Denver South, Denver, and, and, um, and, and other organizations and, and municipalities. Um, this is a timeline, and you'll notice that this timeline is really aggressive. And, and what really started us on this conversation and down this road anyway was, was a meeting that we had with the Office of Economic Development and International Trade when they said that they were at the direction of the governor interested in creating a, state, a statewide SEDS. So that put us on the trajectory then of, of looking at, at developing ours for the region rather than having the state do it. So um, because we're trying to be good partners in that effort, and try to meet their timeline as well. That's why we've ended up with such an aggressive schedule. But MetroVision gives us a really solid jumping off point. So it's not like we're starting from square one. And honestly, sometimes in this game, it's a little bit better to be the second mouse instead of the early bird, if you get that analogy. And, and this is what I mean by that, because right now the EDA has issued new SEDS going forward and really streams, streamlines the process and streamlines the content rather than what you see on the left, which, you know, is kind of an uh, interesting doorstop of 150 pages or more. What the EDA is looking at is something that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 pages, but very infographic heavy within those 30 pages. I've reviewed a lot of SEDs, and there are some of them that are upward of 200 pages long. And, and I'm going to assure you that we are not writing a doctoral dissertation here for Dr. Cog's SEDs. It's more like the Cliff's Notes version. And there is actually further guidance from the EDA that they're interested maybe in, in uh, the development of a, a web-only version of the SED, which they think would give much wider access. Well. If the sense has transitioned from being a heavy, heavyweight doorstop to, to being something that's nimble, dynamic, and creative, um, sort of like what we have with MetroVision already, these are some of the elements that, that um, we need to, to be including in our effort on the SEDS. 
So these are all the elements to go into developing a set, and, and it's logical, as you would understand the summary background is really a current snapshot of the region where we are economically speaking and what are the economic drivers? What are the primary industry clusters? What are the demographic trends? And it's all about the data. That's why on that timeline, you saw that the data um, gathering and analysis came early in the process. And then we move into the SWOT analysis and the strategic action plan. And this is where the stakeholders become very important to the process. And, and then we look at an evaluation framework, which is largely governed by the, the governance team, it's called a leadership team, called a strategy team and different sets. And it's how we will define success going forward. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about economic um, resilience in a minute. These, this comes directly from the EDA. This is what the EDA expects all of the elements of the SEDS to, to contain and the questions that they're looking to answer. And, and for the most part, they're, they're pretty straightforward. Economic resilience piece of it includes three primary attributes. They're looking for the ability to recover quickly from a shock, the ability to withstand the shock, and the ability to avoid the shock altogether to the economy. And, and it's a relatively new concept for the EDA and the way the EDA looks at it, it includes both what they call a steady state and a responsive economic resilience initiatives. But I, actually the definition I like the best comes from NACO, the National Association of Counties. And they describe economic resilience as an ability, a, a community's ability to foresee, adapt to and leverage changing conditions to their advantage. That's what we want our SEDS to do. Well, a steady state economic resilience, th those types of initiatives tend to be longer term and their efforts to seek to bolster the region's ability to withstand or avoid a shock. So that would be things like economic diversification. So, so some of us remember you know, the, the downturn in the 90s and the aughts and, and, and what we went through then. And, and that's what they're looking for the, the steady state economic resilience component to include. It's to a sponsor of economic resilience. And, and, and this is interesting because this is very forward looking. And it looks at, at what kind of capabilities does the organization need to develop in order to be responsive in, in, in recovering from an incident? And it doesn't matter if it's something like the Marshall Fire or the, the massive floods we had in 2013 or COVID-19, but technology can play a large part in this. And that's why the EDA has such a, a really strong focus on, on broadband because technology is important for that provision of resilience. Well, you'll notice that the characteristics that are listed here, and, and this also comes from the EDA directly, um, that they're very similar, identical to our own Metrovision. And, and, and what, what this effort is intended to do is to establish much closer working relationships with those other entities already engaged in economic development like Denver South, Metro Denver EDC, or, or local regional um, city, county EDCs. And, and the reference there again, looks at the broad definition, which includes both the static and the response and, and the responsive aspects of, of resiliency. That's what they're looking for. Well, the EDA, because they, they, they're, they're the ones that we have to get the imprimatur from, um, comes with their own set of criteria that they think should be examined uh, in a sense. And those are the seven elements that you see on the screen right now. And, and they say that the SEDS needs to examine them. That doesn't mean that the SEDS needs to have action items addressing every single one of these. Um, they're guidelines and, and, and they want the region to explore what, it, what that means for the economy of, of the region. But it doesn't mean that we have to have a list of 10 objectives to accomplish for manufacturing. So the structure for the development of a SADS is also mandated by the EDA. 
as you would expect. And, and it's very variably referred to as a strategy team, a governance team, a leadership team. But this is the group that overall is responsible for the development of the SEDS. And, and the EDA says that that strategy committee needs to be representative of the main economic interests of the region and has to include members of the private sector, public officials, community leaders, representatives of workforce development boards, institutions of higher education, minority and labor groups, and private individuals. Typical size for a strategy team is somewhere between 12, 15, and 25. Um, a key role that the strategy team plays is to help identify critical stakeholders to participate in the SWOT analysis and the strategic plan development. In our case, with Metro Denver EDC as a really strong partner, we expect that there will also be data sharing and, and, and analysis that is done jointly to help inform both the summary background as well as the evaluation framework. Now, this is not an ex exhaustive list here. It's illustrative. It's meant to provide examples of some of the types of agencies and groups that we know the EDA expects to participate on our strategy team. And in a similar manner, the EDA also has expectations for stakeholders. And, and that's an even broader group. And, and because we know that the EDA is interested in national security and international trade, we might, for example, reach out to the World Trade Center, we have one here, and, and uh, you know talk to them about international trade issues. So these, these are just also illustrative and, and not not uh, exhaustive. The stakeholder group um, can be much bigger and, and oftentimes is much bigger than, than that strategy group, the leadership group. So I pulled a few examples of the sorts of projects and initiatives that other MPOs like Dr. Cog um, have initiated in, in the recent past. And you recognize the Wasatch Front and Mid-America Regional Council. They they uh, participated in a panel discussion uh, with you all last year. And, and then I added the Atlanta Regional Council since we're always looking at Atlanta as a, ben as a benchmark. And in your packet, um, there's a, a, a much more extensive list of, of projects complete with links um, to some of those projects that are listed. Well, we know from, from our early conversations and, and work with the IIJA, um, regional grants initiative, regional grants navigation initiative here, that there's a significant need out there for basic elements like broadband, affordable housing, workforce development, clean energy initiatives, electrification of fleets, microgrid technologies, resilience, wildland urban interface planning. These are the sorts of projects that a SEDS could help jumpstart. We have a lot of work ahead of us, but with the right partners, and we think we've identified most, uh, if not all of them, we can meet both this aggressive timeline and the high bar that we've we've set for ourselves. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Flo. Are there questions? Uh, Director, Executive Director X, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much, and uh, wonderful summary, Flo. Thank you so much for that. I I just wanted to point out a couple of things. And Flo talked about you know being the second mouse in her uh, her metaphor there, and and it is right. So it's, just so you all know, um, Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments uh, (PPACG) or PapaCog, as I like to call them, um, they're going through a similar exercise right now, and they're they're a couple three months ahead of us. But it's been nice to be able to see their progress and they're on a very tight timeline as well. So it's not unexpected. Um, I, I also want to say, listen, we've been very deliberate as you could tell by that time, by the, uh, by, you know, some of the meetings that we've seen, we we've talked to you probably a year ago when we initiated this and been very deliberate about reaching out to economic development professionals and having a conversation to make sure they understand exactly what it is we are proposing. And uh, cause we didn't want, them to feel like we were, you know, trying to usurp what they were doing, right? That we hope that this was something, this was an added value for them, that what this process will do, 
is open up additional federal monies for projects within your communities. And um, once we got in front of them, they fully understood it. And I think more of the questions were, well, why, why haven't we done this before? More so than uh, why are we doing it, right? So it was a great conversation. Listen, we're really going to rely on Metro Denver EDC as a, you know, kind of a, you know, prime partner in this because uh, they're very similar to us in nature. You know, they're a collaborative of economic development uh, professionals. And uh, and uh, so we're, uh, we're we're excited about this. I think there's a great opportunity. And, and I think it's there, there's a lot of value to our region uh, with this. So um, we're Flo and I are both happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Doug. Questions or comments? I I actually had a comment that uh, although the list of stakeholders was not exhaustive, uh, we might want to consider someone like CSU, who through their global programming uh, might bring some insight into uh, you know water use and um, and that kind of thing. Because in addition to wildfire. I think um, understanding water and our needs and trying to um, at least regulate them, understand them and regulate them uh, uh, to begin with, they're both important and they may add some insight. Um, Madam Chair, um, CSU is on a cross here, particularly because they have the SPO campus. Yeah. And 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 that's such an important um, benefit. To the yes. Region. So so they uh, yeah they're they're definitely on our list. Great, excellent, thank you, Director Odoricio. Uh yeah, thank you, and um, I, I'm sorry I'm in transit, but but I'm not driving at this moment, so <laughs> good. That's good. Uh, okay, so I think it's good to have the partners that that we're talking about, and I appreciate it. I think what we need to make sure is that we stick true to the fact that it needs to be a regional effort. Uh, a lot of times people are concerned that um, it tends to be very focused on the on the capital city, uh, very centralized. And we have to make sure that I think that very recently we've learned that um, if, if we have all the employment centers in just a few areas, then when the time comes for us to get transit in these other areas, that is used against some of the folks in the surrounding communities. And we need to make sure that we uh, are really talking about economic development because I kind of see this as we've been on this highway where you've got all these issues in different lanes, economic development, transportation, equity, uh, environment. We knew they were all on the same highway, but now they're all merging into one lane all at once. And so all these issues are stacking on top of each other. And I just think that we need to, to very intentionally take steps to make sure that we are aware that when, when somebody brings in uh, an economic development win with 800 jobs, that's gonna put more pressure on that community to provide 800 new homes. And that we have to be able to all do our part in, the, uh, in making sure that the balance is there. That also means that that area is probably gonna need some help with roads and transit. And so I just want to make sure that we kind of think through all of the interconnectedness and interdependence that we all have on each other. Now that all these issues are crashing together in this one big merging lane on a very fast highway. <laughs> good comments. I, you know, it's a really good example, I think, or, or, um, uh, the, the way you phrased it, everything merging together, it's very, very true. And there are so many components to be considered, housing, transportation, jobs, all of it, and um, so many other corollary things as well. Thank you. Director Walton. Thank you Did you disappear? Um, <laughs> thank oh, you for you <laughs> thank you for the presentation. Um, as you were talking about resilience, it um, and stakeholders, it um, reminded me of a potential opportunity to invite the Colorado Small Business Development Center out of Boulder. Um, they have a lot of experience from the um, flood 
of 2013, and I think um, perhaps they've been involved in any assistance um, after the Marshall Fire as well. But if you kind of get a little bit deeper into looking for stakeholders in that area, that that is a that might be a great opportunity and maybe some unique perspectives and experience. Um, they also might have um, some ideas of additional people or maybe maybe they, they themselves on some of the success stories after the flood for um, the mountain community of Lyons. And I think that is also to kind of round out the perspectives of our entire region. Um, that would perhaps be a beneficial um, uh, group to reach out to. Thank, Thank you. you, Director Walton. That's an excellent recommendation, particularly to introduce some geographic diversity into the conversation. We, we, we knew that SBDCs were, were gonna be on, on our radio screen along with the, the Workforce Development Council. So um, yeah, thanks for pointing in that direction. Thank you. Very good. Other comments or questions? Well, it sounds quiet, so I think we can move to our next agenda Madam, item. Madam Chair, if I just, if I may, just real quick, certainly, uh, just to tell you what regarding next steps. Um, so we will bring this back to the board at our June twenty first meeting and and request a formal action from the board to allow us to proceed forward. Just wanted to let everybody know this this is not the last time you're going to see it. So thank you. Great, thank you. Very good. So our next uh, item is a discussion oh, on development. Madam Chair, me again. I'm oh, sorry. Um, yes. Gerard Aricio yes. has his hand up. Yes. I, I just want to clarify the action that we're taking, Doug, is to proceed and moving forward as Dr. Cog doing this. The alternative to Dr. Cog doing and leading this effort was is what? Um, unless someone else raises their hand in this group, uh, nobody else. Or, or, well, actually, the state will write something for us. Oh, I guess there's that. So like when, when you say that, it's like the state will write something for the Denver area metro area or the state will do it on its own. Well, yeah, well, well, the state is developing a statewide sense and, and what their intent has been all along is to working with all of the existing EDDs that have comprehensive economic development strategies already in place. And, and that's why, you know, the push for Pikes Peak area COG, Dr. COG and Upstate to complete their SADs is so that, that it just rolls up into the statewide effort rather than having the state write something in a vacuum, which we know sometimes how that goes. So, um, <laughs> well, um, Flo, but also correct me. I thought, that I, you know, the state does, a statewide says that it's not necessarily sanctioned. It wouldn't necessarily qualify as a an official SEDS for this region. That's correct. It would not. So it would not provide us with the access to EDA funding. Ah, oh. so so this is not to, in two weeks. Will not be to approve the specifics, but simply to authorize um the SEDS for this region. Yeah, just allowing us to move forward with it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank Director you. Director Odorisio, are you comfortable with that? Yeah. I, I just it, it whether it's talking to our staff or some other like boards like this, I like to know like what are we what is on the spoon that we're being fed. Um and uh I always like to know, are we being offered light blue, dark blue, and medium blue, or are we being offered other options? And it sounds like the option is either Dr. Cog does this, or it's in a, as a sanctioned effort, which opens the door for EDA funding, or we have the state do it, which doesn't open the door for EDA funding, and then we proceed as the status quo. Those are the two options. That's Great. what I needed to know. Yep. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. So next we have a discussion on development of a regional housing strategy. Sheila Lynch, Division Director, Regional Planning and Development. Thank you for presenting. Please proceed. Good evening and thank you, Madam Chair. Really excited to be back to continue the conversation about housing. I am gonna share my screen.
There we go. I hope you all can see that. Yes, perfect. Looks good. Wonderful. All right. So we thought it would be important to circle back after our great discussion that we had at the board retreat in May to follow up and to further um, discuss what we think the scope and scale of a regional housing strategy will be. So what we hope to cover this evening is to first zero in a little bit more on what's the purpose and intent of a regional housing strategy. Then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about what are our desired um, deliverables and general timeline. And then we'll touch really uh, briefly on when we think about a regional housing strategy, what are those engagement objectives that we have? And then lastly, I'm going to go over what the next steps are to move forward. So as we've shared on other calls, we've explained that um, staff have been very busy engaging with other regions to understand how they've taken on uh, regional housing strategies. Um, we've spoken to a diverse group of regions. At this point, we've had conversations with four, or, sorry, seven different groups. Most of them were led by or in close collaboration with the Regional Planning Council. One was led by a cross-sector consortium um, that focused at a county scale. Um, what we learned is that no regional housing strategy is the same, um, yet we found that there were elements in all of these um, efforts that really could be applicable in the Denver region. So this map shows kind of the areas of, of these regions, who we talked to. Um, they certainly represent many different parts of the country and different sized regions. All of the regions experienced some level of growth and all were contemplating how to expand housing options for diverse needs and income levels. All of them had some focus on, on really trying to address the afford affordability challenges in their region and all included partnerships and collaborations in the development of the regional housing strategy. Many of them are in the, in, in the midst of implementing it and they're developing um, partnerships to do the implementation as well. So as you can imagine, with such diverse regions, there were varied approaches and all tried to respond to their unique contexts. Our initial assessment determined that there's not just one that could be a model, and that's why this slide tries to pull out the key elements that we learned from these conversations that seem most applicable. So first, what all of them expressed was that they recognized that housing um, was really it was important to look regionally because when we think about housing markets, housing markets are regional in nature and also sub-regional. Not all, but a few of them looked at um, sub-market analyses and tried to really use that to um, customize the strategies that they move forward with. Local government partners are in our region are working hard to address this challenge. And one of the things we learned from the other regions is that it's really critical that a piece of this include some technical assistance, resource sharing, convening to really support the efforts at the local level. We learned from many of them that engagement is critical not only during the development of the strategy, but also to think about engagement as you're moving into implementation as well. And one of the things we heard from, from I, more than, than half of them was that regions that took the time to focus their strategies on where we can maximize and align investments saw the greatest results. Specifically, some of the regions spoke to their investments in transportation and how they really aligned their strategies around housing to ensure that they really reaped that, that maximum benefit of that investment. And lastly, we did hear from many of them that it's important to be strategic about how you fund the strategies moving forward, that just developing some great strategies without some thought to how are we actually going to implement them and put dedicated funding towards them, that that's where they saw the greatest results when they did that. So as you all know, from the many conversations with all of you over the last year, 
we see much of the purpose and intent coming from those conversations. While we learn from other regions, we're really leaning on the conversations we've had with all of you to start guiding what's the real purpose and intent of doing a regional housing strategy. And so the board retreat in May was the last conversation we had with all of you. And this slide tries to at least summarize, there was so much rich and great conversation that happened, but we tried to zero in on what seemed like those um, points that seem most critical as we think about the purpose of a regional housing strategy. And so first, um, local communities have done critical work to understand the impacts of the housing crisis in their communities, and we need to draw on those learnings. The second point was that reflecting on the discussions during the legislative session, Senate Bill 213 identified solutions without understanding the breadth and depth of this problem. And a regional housing assessment will help define the problem we're trying to solve so that we can actually design strategies and solutions that can have an impact. The third thing that we took away from, from the uh, last discussion was that uh, regional housing work must include an on-ramp for policy solutions at the state and local level, and that policy strategies need to address this multifaceted problem, and we need to focus on the poli policies that will have that greatest impact. And then lastly, we're not starting from scratch. We have some really great planning infrastructure in our, in our region. And so um, we know that whatever work we do, we need to integrate this into our work through Metro Vision and also our regional transportation plan. Sheila, I just had a question yeah. on key takeaways. We talked a little bit about having or the need for like a project of project managers for all of the initiatives that are going on. And I didn't see that in the key takeaways. Was that uh, just didn't make the top four or where are we at with kind of that thought? Yeah, great point. And I think you'll see as we talk more about the deliverables and timeline and our intent to seek some assistance through consultants, that we will, that is one piece that we will certainly be focusing in on. So deliverables and timeline, um, we wanted to just highlight that there's work underway, that um, behind the scenes, um, Dr. Cog's staff have been busy conducting a lot of different research um, related to the regional conversations that I just summarized. And also they have started a, what we're calling a crosswalk of existing plans. So they have done an inventory to understand what communities across the region have developed um, housing needs assessments or plans in the last five years, and they're going through all of them to really understand where are those common strategies that are emerging. Also, what data and information are local communities using to help understand the challenges in their community, and is there a way to leverage that um, at the at the regional level as well? We've also been busy trying to draft a scope of work to understand what is the work we really feel like we need some um, consulting assistance on. And then lastly, they have been compiling a list of consultants to hopefully we get a, a, a broad response from our RFP. So when we think about specific deliverables and timeline, we have started to define it in three distinct phases of the work. So the first being really about assessment, we need to understand that unmet, unmet demand for housing and also what does our future needs um, look like when it comes to housing. In addition, one of the things that we think is critical is understanding really where is housing in the right places so how do we look at this from a key geographies perspective to understand where should we be investing in housing related to other investments that are already underway or have already been made and then the second piece would be understanding the barriers so why why haven't we seen housing development in the way that that we we know we need it and then developing those strategies. So what would be the critical strategies to address those barriers? And then lastly, we think a big piece of this is then how do we integrate this work 
into the regional planning work we're already doing so that it doesn't become a standalone plan as what if what if folks say that it's a plan that just sits on the shelf that's not our intention at all we want to understand okay how do we carry this work forward into the existing structures we have through metro vision and also our regional transportation plan so timeline there is clearly a critical deliverable before next spring we recognize that we need to be prepared next spring for the legislative session to be able to articulate really what is happening in our region and what are some of the strategies, the, the, the statewide policy strategies that are going to really make the greatest impact. And so we anticipate a deliverable. I will say that a regional housing strategy is hard to develop in six months. So that's not our intention at all, but we will have initial deliverables related to assessment that really can inform that process. And then our hope is that we, by late 2024, have these strategies and we thinking about it in terms of like, what's our regional implementation structure? What does this look like? And have that done by late 2024. So then by 2025, we have that information that we can start integrating into our update to our regional transportation plan and also to integrate it into Metro Vision. So how will we do this? And what does the funding opportunities look like? And one of the things we wanted to point out is that we've talked to you a little bit over the last year in a couple different conversations that certainly through the bipartisan infrastructure law, there is new authority to take on housing through our metropolitan planning organization functions. It's very new. And so we're learning and we're working alongside our federal partners to understand that. One of the things we'll have to do just from a procedural perspective is we'll have to amend our unified planning work program so that it reflects this work. And so on the left side, that is the, the first draft of how we see that um, changing in our, in, our, in our UPWP. And then the other piece of that is that if we use this funding for, um, uh, even portions of the regional um, housing strategy, that funding does require a 20% local match. So we have already started conversations um, primarily at the state level, but looking at different grant programs that might uh, fill that 20% match. So engagement objectives. This is something that many brought up in previous conversations is that we, we, Dr. Cog, will be working closely with our member governments and others to, to really move this forward. So we came up with a few objectives based on that input. The first being that we have to prioritize multi-sector engagement, that housing is a complex issue that requires and, and touches a lot of different sectors. So we need to be ready to do that. Secondly, we need to leverage partnerships to reach diverse audiences that certainly engagement is it's a big piece of this and we need to understand what partnerships we can build to bring these different sectors and to bring different communities into the conversation. The third objective would would be that we would have regular engagement with our member governments at all levels of, of the organization. And then the last piece that it's probably a part of every engagement plan is that we need to have diverse methods, um, both in our hybrid world, but also how do we reach different different groups and what's the best way to to um, really have the dialogue in a meaningful way. So next steps, we thought we'd give you some concrete timeline of how we how we see this happening. So to um, amend the UPWP, we will be taking that to the Technical Advisory Committee on June 26th, and then we will take that to the Regional Transportation Committee on July 18th, and then to all of you at the board on July, sorry, July 18th, and then to the board on July 19th. Whoops. And um, we have started the process of uh, uh, the RFP process. So we hope to have uh, RFP published by late June, early July. And then we will be bring, bringing that forward to um, the finance and budget for review and approval in early August. And then hopefully a consultant under contract by August. This is certainly a fast timeline, but we think we can do it. And we know it's important because we need to get the work underway.
Thank you, Sheila. Yeah. Great presentation. Just a quick clarifying question, the RFP specifics, is that for a consultant to kind of guide or? Yes, so that is, so the consultant can help us with that initial assessment. Um, and we are looking at different options of how we might structure that so that we can um, uh, move the, the work forward as, as quickly as possible and so that we can um, continue to explore different funding options as we go through it. Great. Thank you. Um, Director Harrison. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Uh, both presentations, obviously, and this one as well. Um, my question is really about the engagement objectives in regard to what do you see as from a regular engagement of member governments, diverse methods of engagement of our role to play in terms of trying to reach out at be a liaison for, say, our planning and or communications groups within our governments? Is that what you kind of see maybe going forward? Sorry, you cut out a bit. Can you repeat that? Um, it was in regard to um, the role that we play as directors in terms of the community, the engagement objectives for regular engagement of member governments and diverse methods of engagement. Do you, as as a director, you want us to play that liaison role with our um, with our governments in terms of with our planning department, as well as with our communications leads, and trying to build those relationships so you can have those conversations. That would be really wonderful if you could play that role. role. Um, we also anticipate using some of the existing venues that we have to engage um, member governments. So certainly our city county manager meetings um, and also different ways that we've engaged staff throughout the years. But if you can help provide that liaison role, that would be very, very helpful. Good, I can do that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Director Walton. Thank you. Um, I had a similar question and, um, you know, just kind of what kind of heads up can we give staff and be letting them know that um, this is an init initiative and that it's very important that municipal governments participate. Um, so thanks, sorry for the question. I um, have a second question about um, coordination with other entities that may be um, interested in participating and influencing the legislation, the next round of legislation, assuming that's all coming. You know, we talked about at the board retreat that we had the benefit of being right on the heels of the session ending and sort of hot off the presses kind of conversations. And so, you know, I think that um, there was definitely interest and hopefully still is in the, in the urgency I'm sensing from your presentation, Sheila, of let's keep going. And I see that it's defined as developing a regional strategy. Um, not let's write the legislation as necessarily the objective, but by the way I'm connecting the dots is by creating the regional strategy and providing information in a timely manner to those who are influencing the actual words on the paper on a future bill. Hopefully that is where we are seeing the fingerprints of our work be influencing um, some policy making at the, the state level. So I'm kind of seeing a head nod. Um, so, okay, so in that regard, um, what other groups are kind of like hot off the presses, we got to do something so we can have our fingerprints on this as well. And how are we coordinating with that? How is our work not going to duplicate or how can we collaborate with other groups who also have um, interest in this? <laughs> Doug, you, you want to go ahead? Yeah, I'll, yes. I'll go ahead and start it at least. Um, Director Walton, thank you for the question. Yeah, so we, I've, I've already had some conversations with some of those folks. So in particular, CML, for example, Kevin Balmer and I have, have, have chatted a couple of times specifically about this, and he's fully supportive of the work that we're planning to do over the next seven, eight months um, and willing to participate um, to the degree that we feel is, is suitable for them to do so. So, and and uh, also had, had conversations. I actually spoke on a panel at CCI's summer conference 
um, last week and uh, was lucky enough to sit next to John Swartout, the executive director of CCI, and we had a great conversation um, about what we're proposing to do and and how we can incorporate um, you know CCI into that work as well. So. Um, you know, so th those conversations are beginning right now, uh, Director Walton. I wouldn't say that they're they're comprehensive or complete yet, um, but we're planning on you know having a big tent with regards to our engagement with this. We through email correspondence, we've had conversations with um, with uh, with various parties and even you know in the governor's office and suggested that you know we invite them to participate and learn as we learn about um, you know some of the. Some of the opportunities and barriers, um, you know, over the next seven, eight months. So, um, you know, we're we're really going to we're, we're taking this part to heart because I think it's extremely important that that everybody understand what it is we're doing and can have an opportunity to learn with us. So, we're uh, you know, if you have any ideas of, of particular groups that you would like us to be involved uh, with or like to reach out to, please just let us know. I know that. Um... I think it's the Metro Mayor's Caucus is meeting yeah. or maybe today they met. And so, you know, I think that some people are also Dr. Cor Cog board members. And so. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Uh, so actually, Sheila was at uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus this morning and um, there was a presentation that was given. Uh, well, one of the presentations at the, that you all saw at the board retreat um, related to the corridor uh planning initiative stuff, but um, but Sheila also kind of laid out to Metro mayors today exactly what we're proposing to do in the short and longer term. Okay, that's great to hear. I think um, just as a follow-up to um, Ari's question, uh, my, um, I think my computer might be freezing. I'll stop my video, hopefully. Can you hear me still? Yep. Um, yes. it, it might be helpful if there's an email that goes out to board directors that then we can forward to our city and county administrators just to say hey heads up this is coming this is the yeah no i think that that's a great suggestion uh director walton i i would suggest that we would rather do that we'd like to do that maybe after we get the approval of the upwp amendment um so, the, so i don't want to be presumptuous as to what the board wants to do fair enough okay thank you thank you chair Thank you so much. Uh, Director Maurer. Um, yeah, I'm in my mobile office as well. <laughs> it, looks like, it looks like I've got a halo going on over here or something. Um, but I'm just wondering, Sheila, and thank you for your presentation. This is a really, um, it's a difficult um, task you've got right now, and I appreciate everything you're doing. But I'm I'm wondering when we're looking at these strategies, you know, X, Y, Z, is there a way that we can kind of define that we have expectations or that we have goals that we think that they'll, you know, strategies X, Y, Z, and I'm just going to throw this out there that they, you know, we think that there'll be a percentage of housing that this will, you know, produce those kinds of things, because it's great to have all the strategies. But, you know, just like we're doing a study and I'm going, oh, I don't think that strategy is going to give us much where other strategies might. And there might be, you know, working with the consultant predictions out there. Do you, is that possible? Yeah, thank you, Director Maurer. This is that's a great question, because I do think we want to be as pragmatic as possible. So our strategies really need to be based in some understanding of the need and what's really feasible so that we can be able to get a better sense of like how how will this strategy really impact housing um i think that's why we'll probably end up with many many different strategies because i think what we're real all realizing there's not just one or two strategies right we have to really be creative and i think so, one of the things we'd like to do especially i highlighted the piece about submarket analysis one of the things that we think would be really helpful is to have some level of submarket analysis because the strategies that may work in one part of the region or one context may not work everywhere so we have to be very mindful of that as well that sounds great. Thank you. And if I could uh, interject here as well, it seems that um, that as long as we have the local decision making as part of this, um, it's very helpful to look at the big picture, the regional picture, because if a business located locates in city A, 
and uh, City B is right across the street, the housing needs uh, and all of the support needs infrastructure is going to um, influence uh, both areas. So uh, it is a combination of um, all of us working together and being able to make decisions for our own communities, just my opinion. Director Baker. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Sheila, I'll, I'll echo the, the great um, response to this presentation. It's much needed. We all know this work needs to get done. And um, I'm a little concerned with the timeline if the intent is to, uh, and I don't think it is, but to stave off any legislation, because I think the state legislature will come out of the gate um, hot and, and running. And um, it may, the fact that we, if we progress far enough along in that process to be able to give them a plan um, that is reasonable and able to be followed, it may influence that legislation to a degree, which is something that I think is important. Um, Timeline, again, a little concerning because of, of when it would be done. The other thing is the RFP is the most important part of this. Getting uh, maybe all of those points that were in 213, 213 revised one, 213 revised two, B subsection four, um, remove below, strike below, all those things. Getting that along with, and I'm going to echo um, um, Director Walton's measure of success. And I'd be interested in hearing more about the um, strategies that we've looked at and their measures of success, because I believe that's the hardest part. So getting the RFP written in such detail that we don't have to go back and revise it because contractors are, you know, original contract and then change orders, you know, uh, can add <laughs> cost quite a bit. So those are my concerns. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Director Starker went away. Thank you very much. Uh, Sheila, great uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I, will I was at the, uh, at the Metro Mayor's Caucus uh, meeting this morning and, and had a good presentation from Sheila. Uh, and some other uh, presentations relative to developing the uh, regional strategy and, and it were very well received by the caucus. Uh, I think it's important, you know, we surveyed our members uh, last week and fully two thirds of the membership uh, cities had uh, either produced or were in process of producing an affordable housing strategy and an action plan. Um, and I would think that that a lot of this information would help inform a regional plan that Dr. Cog would would bring out that and what what I would hope is that as we as we survey these plans and, and uh, reach out on a local level to find creative solutions and ideas on how to proceed and how to address the issue, that we also come together with sort of some common agreement on data points so that we can talk together kind of with a common language and a kind of common data um, uh, set and also that would really be, be uh, valuable in sort of formulating our goals so that we can so that we can sort of set goals locally and and uh, that that coordinate with goals and the same data set that we look regionally and look at goals and benchmarks and also so that as we update our plans on a periodic basis you know I think the uh, the uh, uh, land use bill that was uh, introduced this spring had sort of a five or six year, you know, window to to keep these plans updated. That that as we update, we're we're updating locally with sort of some da same data strategies that we've uh, used before. So, great uh, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Director Starker. Director Levy, you're next. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. I really appreciate everybody's comments and, and Sheila, your presentation. Uh, I um, I wanted to just put a plug in for um, 
keeping in mind that there's a reason to have this conversation and to develop this regional housing strategy that's not related to Senate Bill 213, or I should say the bill that will not be mentioned. <laughs> you know, that that you know, as I as I hear a lot of the comments, it's very reactive and trying to to preempt or or heavily influence a subsequent land use bill. And um, I think we should be approaching this also from the standpoint of how can this kind of regional housing um, plan really benefit the work that we do here. And I, I think it's I think it's very much needed for that purpose as we look at at transportation funding and not um, I, you know just how how can we optimize that fund that funding? How can we uh, once we have a really clear regional understanding of um, both the housing that exists, the housing that's on the drawing boards, and the housing that we need in the future, how can we make our transportation system complement that so that we we have um, the as much mobility among areas that have housing, um, but maybe not so many jobs and jobs that don't have housing, et cetera. So I see, I see a lot of benefits to doing something like this that are really independent of the land use bill, and I think um, I think there's actually greater potential for for us, this diverse group of uh, of governmental entities, to um, come together on something that um, you know that maybe isn't legislatively focused. So I you know, just wanted to keep that in mind as we think about what we're really trying to get out of of this. That there is a whole lot more to get out of it than something that might uh, influence subsequent. Uh, legislation. Thanks. Good, good points. Definitely, Doc, uh, Director Dyack. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I I concur with Director Levy. I think there are some short and long term um, uh, issues. Uh, I, however, um, are, I'm going to focus on those short term um, influencing uh, things within the region here in the next six months. Um, you know, to me, I think um, it's you know. I'm, I'm writing here and listening. It, it feels like we need to get collaborative. Um, you know, uh, Executive Director Rex indicated CCI, CML, the governor's office. Uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus was um, was was discussed. I've I've had conversations with the uh, uh, the incoming executive director um, Heidi Williams, uh, just at, at a very 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 high level. Uh, DMAR um, has indicated. Denver Metro Association of Realtors have indicated. Some interest in um, uh, being a part of the conversation. Um, I don't know HBA Homeowners Association that that would be good, as well as to uh, to bring in our state legislatures um, to really show them what we're trying to do, to try to um, bring them into the conversation. So hopefully, uh, we can educate and inform uh, together. I think that would be good, and um, you know I think here within the next six months, uh, building momentum. Um, within the media, potentially, um, you know, as as Director uh, Starker indicated, uh, data and performance measures. I think uh, those that drive our strategies would be of interest. I think uh, to those people to to again educate and inform uh, not only our our compatriots but the people out there to for them to get an understanding of what we truly are doing at this point in time to to achieve. Um, these uh, optimal housing uh, within our communities, and um, you know, maybe even a newspaper thing. Um, you know, I I talked to a uh, individual on the board, and uh, maybe an op-ed or two. If we only had a old newspaper guy who can uh, who can write one or two of those things, it'd be great. That is all. Thank you. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I think um, because. To have a stakeholder like um, the home builders um, seems important to me because as we develop these strategies, we want to make sure that they are strategies that also um, give a comfort level to builders because there's a national housing shortage and someone could choose to build in you know, New Hampshire or Iowa instead of building here if uh, if things get too difficult, too challenging, or uh, are too disorganized. So I, I think that's a good suggestion as well. 
Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And uh, I also, as uh, Director Levy said, I, I want to thank for everyone for the conversation today. This has been wonderful. Um, you know what Director uh, Levy had said, it really resonated with me with regards to our, there are obviously long-term reasons to do this outside of any legislative. And Lord knows that Sheila's been preaching that to me ever since we had this conversation. I guess I'm a little more transactional than what Sheila is, and thank God we have her. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I'm looking... You know, I think if we're to, listen, we're still we're still trying to figure out a funding strategy associated with this long term study. Right. Um, you know, we're committed to, you know, getting us through the first phase of this through the end of the year. And uh, but, but as Sheila mentioned, we are exploring some other options at the state level ver through various dollar grants or maybe something might happen in the legislature next uh, next session that frees up some additional monies for for studies of this nature. Um, but I just wanted to throw that out there. We haven't fully realized the, the funding strategy for this, but we're, I think we're in pretty good shape through the end of the year. It's just more of an FYI than anything at this point. Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you. Are there other comments or questions? Yes, Director Teal. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm actually in my mobile office as well. It is called the Parker Arby's. So please excuse any background noise. The, uh, going to Doug's comment, but also back to Sheila's about uh, funding. And obviously we have an immediate funding issue, but then uh, of, of this program, but then Sheila was talking about how this could likely open up other funding strategies. Should we also have when we modify our unified work plan, should we also have a uh, analysis of what funding strategies there could be long term, as opposed to what they're not, so that part of a, a short term product that could be presented at the end of this work of this year, going into the next legislative session, where the gaps in any sort of fiscal uh, progress going into years. Uh, future could could be identified and brought to the legislators legislature's attention. Maybe an, an additional piece to add to the uh, the work list for us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Director Teal. Thank you for the comment. Um, I will say that I I don't think it's necessary to include that in the UPWP, and I tell you why. The, the Unified Planning Work Program is specifically related to the tasks that we would accomplish with using our federal money. So, you know, a, a task such as what you're proposing would not necessarily be uh, be allowed, be an allowable expense associated with that. But I think you're right, though. I think that is something that we, you know, whether it's in a work program or not, that we have to we have to really, um, you know, put our put our heads together and figure out a plan. And if I may, Madam Chair, since I have the floor right now, I, um, you know, the other thing that, you know, we're, it's going to be, you know, pretty fast paced that we're going to go through here between now and the end of the year. And, um, you know, I just want you all to know that we're hopeful that we can rely on your staff and the resources that you have as well to, uh, to get us some of the data and information that we need. And, i just say, as an example, um, you know, some of the testimony that uh, Director Baker shared in uh, related to Senate Bill 213 referred to 108,000 units that were entitled in Arapahoe County. And, and we've had conversations with Arapahoe County staff and exactly how they accomplished that and how they work with the local governments within Arapahoe County to be able to aggregate that data up. And, you know, a task such as that, well, I think we would hope that other counties as or other communities would would um, you know, you know, would jump on that and, and be able to provide that in a timely fashion so that we can, you know, move faster even. So I, I just wanted to share that. But you know, ultimately we're gonna try to scotch tape together whatever whatever data sources we have right now in order to get to to that finish line at the end of the year. So thank you. Thank you. And I see uh Sheila had added uh um uh, Let's see, thank you for guidance from um, Director Odoricio about SWEEP um, and housing advocates to the list of st stakeholders to engage. Um, 
those are those are both important um, comments and groups to to add as stakeholders, not strategy necessarily, but stakeholders. So, other questions or comments. All right, then. If are there other matters from members? Hearing none, uh, there is an effort to cancel our July 5th meeting. So our next board work session is most likely on August 2nd. Uh, it will be uh, at our regular four o'clock time. And at this point, it is 5.05 and we are adjourned. Thank you for productive discussion and for attending today. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Thank Take you. Care.